Our next guest comes from a little set website called Man Repeller, which I find a little bit interesting because uh, the two women that are about to join our stage are two of the most beautiful and brilliant women I've ever seen. There's no way in hell they are repelling any men. Please welcome to the stage Leandra Medine and Alexia Tsotsis. Way to manage expectations, Jordan. <laughs> no pressure. All right, so how many of you have heard of Man Repeller? Not from, early, not from Jordan, but in general. Before Jordan said Man Repeller, how many of you have heard of it? Raise your hands. OK. How many of you are fans? Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> Leslie's backstage raising her hand, both hands. Leslie <laughs> looks so cool. I wish she would come out and show everyone. How cool Leslie is. Yeah, she looks so cool today in her bow tie. Yeah, Leslie, come, come out on, for a Leslie. second. Come Les on, Leslie. Leslie's part of the crew, can she? OK. All right. Look at her. <laughs> Look at that bow tie and those How cool many shoes? of you are Man Repeller fans? Me. OK, there you go. <laughs> Is that it? That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> so I, I, I guess I will be the thousandth person to ask you what's a Man Repeller for the five people that didn't raise their hand or 10 people. So I launched Man Repeller in 2011 when I was a junior in college. And it started as a site about trends that women love and men hate. So I was essentially chronicling all the stuff that I was wearing. Like this jumpsuit, for example. <laughs> Where is my body? Is there a body? Are there legs? Um, <laughs> not, not so easy to get off. I, one time interviewed Chloe Sevigny and we were talking about man repeller and she was like, I feel like leotards are the ultimate man repeller. And I was like, huh, talk to me about that. I don't understand why they're tight, they're fitted, you can see everything. And she's like, no vaginal access. And I was like, very difficult okay. to access that with the leotard. The plot thickens. <laughs> but so I started this site as a site about trends that women love and men hate. And often I would take photos of myself and put them on the site of me wearing these trends. And it was supposed to be a call to action for us as women to celebrate what we want to wear. And it was also a way to sort of regain ownership over the status of our love lives. I was devastatingly and desperately single when I launched the site. Um, and I felt like calling myself a man repeller gave me a sense of ownership over that decision. Like I'm single because I choose fashion. I favor fashion over companionship. And then I started, I started dating That's my a husband. Good choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was like, I'm just kidding, guys. It's a process of elimination. <laughs> so did you, did you really think you were single because of what you were wearing? No, I think that was really literal, but it was a nice way to take a little pressure off myself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's changed, of course, so much since launch. And we were talking about this backstage. If it started as a site about trends that women love and men hate, it's become an overall funny website, or yeah, funny website for serious fashion. And I think that probably in the last four or five months, I feel more comfortable calling it uh, a microphone for women that uses fashion as its language to connect. Like what, That's the language we're fluent in. So did you invent this phenomenon? Because I was man repelling s since high school. <laughs> and I actually have a picture, a image. Again, it's going to be a Bill Maris. No, this is me in high school. That is I, I had are a rainbow scarf. Clips? What? Are there butterfly clips in your hair? Yes, there are at the end. So tight. And I'm about 16. I'm wearing brown lipstick. I have zero eyebrows. That was the trend then. Do you remember the 90s, guys? <laughs> Anyways. This was not attractive to, to men. Men hate patterns. Even now when I wear a pattern, my boyfriend's like, you look like a tablecloth. Um, yeah, well, so that's you what's interesting. You take it down now. <laughs> down. I don't want to look at it anymore. Thank you. I guess that's what's interesting <laughs> about man repeller, right, is that it's sort of a social condition that absolutely predated 
my existence on web. Um, I think that I just identified it and was the first to give it a term. And maybe that's why it seems so pervasive now. And we just celebrated our five year anniversary and everyone's like, what, just five years? And I'm like, well, no, Manor of Helling goes way back. It's ancients. Yeah. yeah. Ancient ancients. Greeks and Romans, especially the Greeks. Especially yeah. the Greeks. <laughs> Egypt. Egypt, exactly. So your first blog was called Boogers and Bagels. Mm -hmm. Well, it was actually called Four Months in Paris. It was chronicling my time abroad when I was studying. I came home and I was like, this is so wonderful because I went to school for journalism. That it's so great that I'm writing content and just clicking publish and that is it. It is out in the internet and people can consume it if they want to and not if they don't and nobody's trying to edit it. So that's when it became Boogers and Bagels when I got back and the four months were up. And um, I would say probably like three months after I renamed that site, I had this idea for Man Repeller, and I was like, okay, I'm going to take an entirely new direction. So, and now it's hundreds of millions of, no, that's not, that's the other person. Now it's millions of page views a month, and you've got six people on the team. Wait, got what other person? Bill Maris. Oh, that, lucky. That's the money under management. Okay. He doesn't feel like it because all of his friends are So we're at like 10 million. Yeah, you're, that's okay, right? <laughs> 10 million page views? Yeah. Congratulations. Thank yeah, you. that's great. That's solid. That's about a, that's, you know, those are real numbers. Uh, how do you go from burgers and bagels to millions of views and a six person staff and contracts with NARS? I mean, mad influence. I think you were voted more influential than Anna Wintour in, in fashion. Yeah, I, that, was, that was probably a mistake. Um, but th that ad week list was probably <laughs> one of, week. yeah, that was ad week. That was probably one of the first indicators that I was sitting on something that had potential to be much bigger than I am. Because when I launched Man Repeller, I didn't see it as a business, right? It was a lifestyle. And I think that probably until like six months ago, it still felt like a lifestyle. What made you feel like, oh, hey, this is a legit business. I'm going to scale this. I'm going to start using jargon. <laughs> I'm going to start talking about optimization and horizontal exactly. growth. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I knew that there was a point of view that was worth being heard and that the, the media space was changing so much. And I'm still of the belief that a loyal following is going to be more important and is more impressive than just a whole big host of page views that amount to like a lot of nothing. And I felt like building this place for women to feel comfortable. And I often say this, so I have probably said this to you and for the two and a half fans in the audience. I apologize that you have to hear this again. But when I was younger, Sex in the City was such an important show for me. Because I would sit, when I, whenever I felt lonely or upset, um, I would turn it on and just feel like I was immediately connecting with these women who had no idea who I was, who I had no real connection with, but they made me feel like I was not otherized. And when I realized that Man Repeller was starting to do that, for younger girls, for like that offbeat girl who's 14 or 15 and sitting in her bedroom in Ohio and whose friends do not understand her, um, I, I felt really excited by the prospect of turning that into something much bigger. An army of man repellers. Army, <laughs> army of man repeller with their arsenal of harem pants. So have you ever considered uh, venture capital? I feel like you're, you're one of the only entrepreneurs that we have up here who's bootstrapped. Um, it's certainly a conversation that happens internally. And when I say internally, I literally mean in my head. And I think that <laughs> uh, it's, I, I'm so good at, at talking myself in and out of the same ideas over and over. It's like this terrible VC hamster wheel in my head. And the hamster's like, I'm getting the fuck off this wheel. Mm. Just shut up. Mm -hmm. um, we have not taken on money yet. I, it is not something that I am entirely opposed to. I just feel like in building what my vision is, where it currently stands, we can continue to bootstrap. How would you pitch Man Repeller? to VCs? Uh, <laughs> I want to say something silly, like your entryway into the Mark Jacobs fashion show. But it's so in build, Man Repeller is not just going to be a, a content site on 
line for much longer, right? Yeah. I'm actually going to use that word and say that I'm hoping that within the next five years, we are growing horizontally. And I've noticed that my fans are much more, hey, I'm such a big fan of yours on Instagram, and I love your social media presence. And I'm like, that is so not the point. Like the, 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 or in my head, I've been feeling like the company is so much bigger than just what happens from a, a mobile device. But ultimately, in thinking through who we are, we're entertainers, right? We're, we're providing this brain break to our audience. And so we need to be where the brain break is occurring. The bathroom. The bathroom or on a treadmill. So that means man repeller podcasts, right? Or on their phones. So that means actual, smart, insightful narratives that are being built on Snapchat and Instagram and on Twitter and like maybe on Periscope, which really drains battery. Um, and then I don't necessarily know that because I'm passionate about fashion and I have a sort of out of the box way of thinking through it, that means that I'm producing product, but something that we've been toying around and I'm starting to think about much more seriously and might require VC money is, or any money really. So if you have any, give me. You have cash on it. At Man Repeller. <laughs> um, is a subscription box, right? Where we're collaborating with different designers and manufacturers and building limited run, customized product and pushing that out seasonally. So here are the five things you need every season from us and you can't get them anywhere else. That's news. That's news. So a, a Man Repeller subscription box would be something that I, you know, I would get for sure. But I think you could probably monetize that quite effectively, seeing as though the only subscription boxes I've tried of fashion were, were quite cheap, and it doesn't seem like your, your aesthetic is cheap in the slightest. Right. It's not really a matter of cheap or not cheap, though. I, I feel like I would want it to be um, an actual useful service that made life feel a little easier and more fun, because that's also the direction that fashion is going, right? Is people just want to feel understood and know that they can live their lives in the things that they have. So you'd say to, you'd say to VC, hey, I'm going to give, I'm gonna give women or men who are into to pockets and big sheaths of fabric, whatever they need for the season, every season in a box. Yeah. You know, like birch box, but. Yeah, and there's going to be yeah. content that's being built around it and that our content is going to live across various different channels. We're going to hit them from every angle, every orifice. When do, <laughs> unless they're wearing a leotard. <laughs> unless they're wearing a leotard. <laughs> that would be difficult. And then you expect this in the next year or? In the next two years, yes, definitely. Uh, you mentioned Instagram. You used Instagram really early on. You actually have Man Repeller on Instagram. How did you hear about it? How did I hear about Instagram? Gosh, it was really early. I think that I had just gotten an iPhone and I heard about this uh, photo filtering app and I was like, oh, that's cool. Maybe I can filter my photos and then, you know, email them to myself and use them on manrepeller.com to save on photography fees. So that's why I started using Instagram. Um, and really early on, someone from the team, I think Josh, I think a man named Josh, emailed me and was like, hey, we're so happy you're on Instagram. We'd love, to, we'd love any feedback if you have any. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. OK, bye. <laughs> a year later, a billion dollars later, I'm like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sad I didn't invent <laughs> Instagram as well. Uh, do you have an Apple Watch? Not yet. Are you going to get one? Mm -hmm. I thought that was going to be my TechCrunch goodie bag. It was not. So I'm out of here. Look under your seats, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I, took Oprah, that. I took it. <laughs> Do you think the, the fashion industry targeting or the hard sell of the Apple Watch is working? Like they're giving it to Beyonce. All of a sudden, Beyonce's got this uh, Bay Watch, if you will. Right. Well, it's gold with the links. I frankly think it's a good product. It's a good looking product and it's like having a personal assistant on your wrist. And so I don't necessarily know. It, it's a chicken or egg thing. Like is, is fashion facilitating its success or is the, the, facil the usefulness and utilitarian nature of this product that is also really attractive facilitating its own success and therefore fashion flocking to it? 
Why do you think wearables haven't taken off in the fashion industry thus far? Fashion is a unique industry in that it needs time. And there's, there's this very intense level and sense of control within the industry where people that are in positions of power just want to own the space. They want to know that it belongs to them. And I think that when technology becomes involved and when you start to think about um, social media at large and just these ever-expanding audiences where there are no caps, period, it's hard to digest the fact that you can exist in a space that you're not also owning. So Kanye is like, I want to own the wearable space, so Jawbone can't have penetration. Like, who's gonna? What's the? That sentence did not make that that much sense. <laughs> but what's the block? Who's trying to own wearable, the wearable space from the fashion industry perspective? Uh, the the designers. The designers. Yeah. The. There's this sense of independence, right? That we need ourselves and only ourselves, and this is our industry, and, and we've built it, and it's become what it's become because of us. And d does that mean that we bring in third-party help, you know, uh, to, to build wearable tech that, you know, requires a, like a, a shimmy into Silicon Valley or whatever, and I think that that's really hard for a lot of designers, specifically the ones who are so nostalgic for the days of yore in fashion. So why are they embracing Apple? It's a different vertical. It's a different medium, right? It's like you, you work in fashion, you build your product, but in order to operate the business, to run the business, you need, I mean, you can't be sending faxes, right? And so it's just a natural outgrowth of I already have a MacBook, I already have an iPhone, mm -hmm. I'm okay with sticking this on my wrist because it's... Right, and I, I mean, more and more we probably will see it, but I'm thinking specifically about wearable tech beyond this watch. I'm thinking about how designers are going to start to want to integrate technology into, like, the skirts that we're wearing and the coats that are keeping us warm, and that's going to take a little bit of time. Is there a way that Silicon Valley and the fashion industry can work together so we can get those warm coats as soon as the next winter happens? I mean, I think that intersection is smacking us in the face, right? Instagram is winning the Media Award this year at the CFDA Awards on June 1st. So that's something. So you've mentioned Instagram. Uh, what other apps do you like? I like Snapchat. I've been, I, I just snapped like five minutes ago. You guys can follow me, man underscore repeller, or us, I should say. I've been using Snapchat a lot. Um, I like, I guess I use Uber, but that's, who doesn't use Uber, right? I, um, but in terms of social Lyft media... Lyft founders use, don't use Uber. And Via. <laughs> I, I like Via very much. What's Via? It's, um, it's an app that is operating from up, or I think just in New York right now, from Uptown to 14th Street, and it's a shared ride, and there's a $5 flat fee. It is literally what buses could have been, or or can or are, but in much smaller increments. Oh, that's interesting. It's so great. It's $5. Is it available in San Francisco? I don't think yet. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> What's the, you know, you have a lot of fans, you have people coming up to you on the street being like, oh my God, it's you. Do people ask you to wear their clothes? Do you get people saying, you're so influential, will you wear this, this pair of shorts I designed? Yeah, I think that happens really frequently, but so much of the reason that I've been able to build Man Repeller is because of my style and the point of view that I project with clothes. And so for me to say yes or no based on anything other than personal interest doesn't quite make sense. And last question. If you couldn't run Man Repeller, what company would you want to run? If I couldn't run Man Repeller? Yep. I, you know what? So I was at uh, Sloan Kettering yesterday because my grandfather just had surgery. And I was in the convenience shop getting a coffee. And I'm looking around this shop and I'm getting so frustrated with the fact that you cannot find a single food product or drink that is without added sugar, without some version of something processed. And I'm thinking to myself that so many of 
the cancer cases in America and disease at large is a result of the way that we're eating. And it seems so confounding to me that you're at a hospital for cancer, for cancer treatment and your only food options are like bag of potato chips for like colon cancer perpetuation or bag of sour patch for diabetes perpetuation, right? And so I, I feel like I would love to run a company that is going into all these hospitals and building some sort of educational food program so that you're going in there and getting food that you can, I, I got very, very frustrated with that. In Greece, if you go to the hospital, there's people smoking outside with their, like, yeah, it's chemo. A, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, that, it's true. That's actually something that, that we need more education around preventative health versus treating things that you've already caused by bad practice. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, cancer repeller. Cancer repeller. Anyways, to, to end on a high note. Um, anyways, thank you, Leandra. You've thank been you. a pleasure. And hopefully we will talk That's more so about real. stage. Yeah.